Okay. How's everybody doing today? Great. I'm great. I'm great. I am very, very excited for, for you all to um, mostly hear from Patrick and mostly answer your questions. So um, we presented to a handful of folks this concept of masterclass. Um, and I don't know, did anybody get to do Shenny's masterclass? But I think um, some of, of what this group has done for each other has really shared our area of expertise either through exposure, like all of them coming to Andela here. Um, we did the same thing with a Shesse University. We all went to a Shesse University. Um, and even when the group first formed, we really got to know each other and got to know, hey, what are what is your area of expertise or what is your greatest passion? Um, and many of the things that you hear about from Andela around ethical leadership come from a Shesse University and come from Patrick. I was deeply, deeply influenced by, by their model. So, um, so because of that, I'm gonna just start off with a few questions to, to Patrick, uh, you know, that kind of get to the heart of that. And then I know you all have read Patrick's bio and have things on your mind. Um, and so Patrick, if that's okay with you, we'll just dig in as much as possible. Um, okay, so Patrick, uh, we talked over lunch about, um, you know, kind of everyone's leadership journey and yours at one point in time, you just decided I'm going to quit my job at Microsoft, <laughs> even though it's going really well and, um, and go back to your, your home country and, and start a university. Um, it doesn't sound completely crazy to me after my last five years, <laughs> right. but I remember being in a different position. Like I remember my, where I was eight years ago when I was meeting Rita, sitting in a classroom and thinking that is an impossible, that seems like an impossible step, you know, to just go out on my own and do that. So tell us about that juncture. Like what were you thinking? What did your family think? Like how did you make that huge decision to leave everything and go back to start a chess? Well, I made the decision, um, first of all, I, I describe it as sort of a pre-midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> I was at Microsoft and um, the conflict in Somalia and Rwanda occurred. And shortly after Rwanda in particular, my son was born. And it seemed to me that the stories coming out of Africa were really bad for future generations. So that was the first thing that got me thinking, we need to change the narrative in Africa. And the way you change the narrative is you actually change the continent. Mm -hmm. um, and then I finally thought, well, people like me ought to be part of creating that change and changing the narrative. Um, so I wanted to initially start a software company in Ghana and uh, backed up on that because the computer science education in Ghana at the time was not really fit for purpose, um, but I, I decided that leadership was a more fundamental problem. And so if we could change the way uh, future leaders were, were educated, that we would actually have a deep, deeper change on the continent. So that's what my thinking was, um, was start a university, demonstrate a different way of education that focuses on ethics and critical thinking and problem solving and innovation and set the example for other universities. And if we can create a sea change there, that we will change a whole generation coming out of universities that are going to be in leadership positions. Um, and then there was just the, the question about, should I leave Microsoft to go attempt something so radically different than, what, than my comfort zone or what I, I knew? Um, I asked my wife one morning about quitting Microsoft that day and let's go to Ghana and she immediately said yes, which was a total shock to me. Um, yeah. She grew up in Seattle, she's, she's American, I wasn't expecting that. Um, but it took me, I think a year or a year and a half after I had my wife's phone permission mm. before I walked away from Microsoft. Mm. Um, and the reason it took me a while was because I was scared. Uh, I thought, you know, this is such a mission impossible. I'm not equipped for it. Um, I was afraid of failure, uh, and eventually I decided, well, let's manage the fear. let's manage the fear, and I managed the fear by going to grad school, learning how organizations work, and I started the planning for this university while I was a graduate student. Mm. So that was a way to sort of ease into it. 
what, what was the, like, replay that conversation with your wife for us. I know her now, I've met her, and, uh, and she's extraordinary, but I just, uh, I'm so curious. It was actually very simple. Yeah. Um, I literally, I woke up, I was in bed, um, and I turned to her and I said, Rebecca, what would you say if I said, I'm going to quit Microsoft today, let's go to Ghana, let's do education. And she just said, let's do it. Wow. So I sat up. So then I sat up. It's like, wait, don't you think we should think about this? <laughs> a little bit before. No. And then she said, no, education is important. And if this is what you want to do, I'm totally fine with it. And then I said, wait, let's think about it. You said what you wanted her to say. Yeah, I was hoping you'd say no. Yeah. <laughs> Make it real simple. Um, what did what did your your team at Microsoft say, and have they been supporters? Have they been involved in your journey at Ashesi? So the the my team, the people I knew at Microsoft, the responses were varied. Uh, so my immediate manager, his first response was, um, "What can we do to keep you? What can mm. I do to keep you?" and I said to him, well, you're competing with a dream. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, I can't compete with a dream. Uh, so all the best with that, right? Mm -hmm. So most of my colleagues at Microsoft, um, I learned later that they thought it was a crazy idea. Mm -hmm. None of them said that to me. Um, a lot of people said, this is what life's all about, go for it. Mm -hmm. Uh, some people said, when, you, when you're done at grad school and you're ready to go, come to us and um, we'll help. Mm. Uh, one of the vice presidents sent an email. I sent an email out and I said, I'm leaving the hive. I'm going to go do this thing. And he responded to the whole email thread and said, when Patrick is done with grad school and he's ready to go start this university, let's all open up our wallets to help him. Uh, and one person said that sounds like more work than here mm -hmm. and that was the closest i got to uh, a negative response mm -hmm. he says it's interesting but it sounds like more work than here, than here. Mm -hmm. um, are you really up for this mm -hmm. I said, yeah. mm -hmm. so, but it was very supportive have you heard fred talk about his major three criteria for starting any kind of new thing? Yeah, I Have think so. I think I remember that. Yeah. It is, are you uniquely suited to this? Can you wake up every day and do it for five years, at least five years? And is it big enough? Yeah. Does that resonate? Well, yes and no. I mean, the uniquely suited for this, if I asked myself that question at the time, I would have said no. Mm. I was not uniquely suited other than the fact that I grew up in Ghana and I know the landscape in Ghana. Mm. I didn't know about how to run a university. Um, so I, I would have at that point said, you know, I'm an engineer, I, this is not my business, right? Um, could you do it for at least five years? Um, I didn't know. Mm. Um, but at the time I, I was leaving Microsoft, I, I, <laughs> interesting so I said this is a 15-year project mm -hmm. and I was going to do it for 15 years and I was going to hand up to somebody um, I also said to my wife um, you know we'll keep our house in Seattle after year one I will ask you how it's going and if you say you really can't live in Ghana after year one we will come back and I'll find somebody else who I'm going to visit in and I'll ask you again after year five. So it wasn't as if I was, on the one hand, I'd said, look, this is a 15-year project, but I was going to check in with somebody who was very important to me about how she's doing with it. And, and that was going to be a matter in terms of what exactly I would do in executing. So I would say that someone who is uniquely suited is obsessed with the problem they're trying to solve. You know, and I hear you on, especially like 
from an engineering perspective. You need right. that expertise, right. but you can't That's replace that definition. obsession yes. with the problem. I, w I had become obsessed with the fact that Africa needed to change, that leadership was critical, that nobody was doing it, and somebody needed to do it. Mm -hmm. Somebody who needed to, to start to educate leaders differently and talk about it and make it part of the conversation. It wasn't part of the conversation. I mean, you could read lots of things about Africa. No one was talking about, you know, the way you educate leaders and really focusing on ethics and innovation is going to be critical, right? Um, there was a there was some conversation about whether we should do aid versus trade, right. you know, stuff like that, democracy right. versus others. But you know, and so I had become obsessed with the idea that somebody needed to do it. And yeah. I, I couldn't see anybody doing it, and so I jumped into it. Yeah. So this idea of leadership, um, it, Shessi has a very specific sort of definition in a way that you train leaders and a way that you teach ethics. How did that come about, and how do you define it? Well, I think leaders are people who are in positions of influence. Um, Across society in your life. So anybody who is influencing others to move in a particular direction is leading those people in a particular direction. And so when I think of leadership, I actually think about a fairly large group of people who are moving our society in, in a particular direction. Um, in determining who those people are, um, one of the things that I noticed was that certainly when I was doing this analysis in Ghana, only 5% of all the college age people, say between the ages of 18 and 25, went to college within the cohort. And so, and those are the people who are going to become judges and lawyers mm -hmm. and head of police and head of military or business people and so on. So people who have tertiary education, there's only 5% of the age group. So almost by definition, the leaders are the people who went to college, right. who went to post-secondary education. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I focused on higher ed. Mm -hmm. Now, the way we are teaching ethics, um, so first of all, it was a proverb that I read, which I think is really important, uh, things from Asia, um, that um, be careful of your care. Be careful of your thoughts because they become your words. Be careful of your words because they become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your character. And your character determines your destiny. destiny right? So when I think about ethical leadership, it's really about character, which means it's about the habits that people have formed, the actions that they've taken, the decisions that they've made. Right, um, and sort of the philosophical, um, let's say their thoughts, the philosophical thinking, mm -hmm. right? So the way we approach it at the Shesi is in the curriculum, there are courses that are really about philosophy, right? They're really about asking the questions about what constitutes a good leader, what constitutes a good society, what constitutes the economy of the good society, um, servant leadership. Um, and it's really based on the Socratic method. It's lots of questions and you know, and trying to answer those questions. So we don't preach ethics of people. We engage in a conversation about ethics about the good society. Mm -hmm. So that's really about shaping thoughts and decisions and decision making. The second part is about shaping actions and habits. And that has to do with um, having a code of conduct on, on our campus that is not owned just by the administration or by the faculty, but owned by the students themselves. <coughs> and that we enforce our rules. And these are rules that, it's a social compact that all of us have agreed, this is what our society is going to look like on this campus. And we enforce it. And by doing so, we end up with people having four years at a chassis, developing a habit 
you know, certain habits of the mind, certain habits of, of action, mm -hmm. right? Certain habits about holding people accountable. Um, and then hopefully that becomes a character mm -hmm. by the time we go out. So you had this pretty tough period with one of your classes where yes. they where the entire class was on probation from the honor code. And the entire campus takes the honor code very seriously. Right. Could you um, could you tell us about that and how it unfolded and what you did? So so the honor code at Ashesi, the code that the students came up with, says that they will not they will not cheat in exams and they will not tolerate those who cheat. And in return, we don't proctor our exams. We don't anticipate exams. So they have the exams out in the week, and they self monitor. Right? Now, as you might expect, every year some people cheat. Um, thankfully, every year that those people cheat are held accountable by their peers. Now, the honor code is also something that is um, adopted by class, by cohort, if you will. So it's not something that the whole university, the exam on the code, everybody's on the When students come as freshmen, they're not on the honor code. They have a one-year debate about it. And then they vote whether they want to be on the honor code or not. And if that class votes by a two-thirds majority or more, then they're inducted into the honor system. So we had a class that had voted to be on the honor system. And I think their vote was over 70%. So they were on the honor system. And then um, I think in the, the end of their second year, they had an incident where there was a lot of cheating in an exam and they did not report it. So uh, they did not report it right away. So end of semester exam occurred in one class, in this finance class, significant numbers of students cheated. The peers did not bring them did not hold them to account. But at the beginning of the next semester, some of those students came forward and said, you know, last semester we had one class where cheating occurred on an exam, and we didn't have the courage to report it, but we feel terrible about it, and we're reporting it now. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, once this report came, those investigations done, we looked at the papers and have submitted and see the patterns. Mm -hmm. So we got confirmation. Um, we had seating charts for every exam so we could tell which treatment. So those people were brought to book. Um, we had the whole class, I think, we take that exam. And then we said, look, because you hesitated so long, we're not so sure that you have um, the strength to hold each other to account. It's not clear to, to us where the moral authority lies in your class. Does it lie with the people who want to cheat? Does it lie with people who don't want, who won't cheat but who don't want to hold others accountable? Does it lie with the, with the people who eventually brought these things to work? Uh, so they were suspended from the honor system. And um, they lobbied very hard. The, the suspension lasted a year. Um, and they were eventually. Uh, brought back onto the honor system because they had uh, behaved in certain ways, and I'm not going to say here, um, they behaved in certain ways that convinced the faculty and the administration that they they were really, you know, ready yes, to get back on the honor system, and uh, they lived up to what we thought. Mm -hmm. Patrick, how do you make that many people from such separate backgrounds or such, you know, how do you make them care that much, you know, about, you know, that they if I understand correctly, it's not that they wouldn't graduate with a diploma, they would, they just, right. they choose to be a, an honor code class or not. Right. How do you create that sense of responsibility in that big a disparate group? I think it's, it's, it's all the conversations that go, that, are, that go on on the campus mm -hmm. in all the classes, the fact they're talking about, we're talking about it. But it's also being very blunt about uh, what cheating means when you're a student. I, I remember mm -hmm. once we had a town hall meeting, and um, it, you know we have these town hall meetings, it's time for me to talk with students, and then 
and the team, and for them to also give me feedback on how things are going and so on. And at that meeting, I started, my first sentence was, there is corruption here. And you could have heard a pin drop when I said that. I just said, there is corruption here. And everybody was very quiet. They weren't sure what I was talking about. We talk so much about we don't give bribes, we don't accept bribes, etc. etc. Mm. I think they were thinking maybe I was going to come talk about that. Mm. And then I said, There's some students here who cheat on exams. What does corruption look like when you're 19 years old? Mm. You know, it's, it's okay to be, we have these seminars, and you guys are so passionate about talking about how terrible corruption is in our country how upset you are with politicians and government officials who are corrupt and so on. Mm. What does corruption look like at your age? And if people here are cheating, how do you know they won't be like the leaders that you're complaining about? And as you can imagine, this just sort of... <laughs> <laughs> the conversation was very interesting at that time, right? But it's just really getting people to understand that you have to be, you know, to quote Gandhi, you have to be the change you want to see. If you want to live in a society that is that is not corrupt, you should learn to create one here on this campus yourself and live by it. Um, it's, the, it's the least you can do to begin that journey, right? And, and then, as I said, it's you let students debate this among themselves. Mm -hmm. And when people are intellectually engaged on this question, they will come to realize the importance mm -hmm. of um, behaving a certain way now yeah. and building a certain character now. I love that story. It gave me chills the first time Patrick told it. And then we all listened. Like we did it, we learned about the story when the when they were first on probation. And then every time we'd see we're like, what's happened with that class? How are they doing? What are they what are the moral yeah, struggles? Yeah, yeah, you're totally invested. Like, I believe in you. But, but, but you know, we saw very yeah, a dramatic drop in plagiarism in the mm. class. Mm. It went to close to zero. Um, they, you know, they sort of enacted plays around ethical dilemmas. Wow. They, they just did a lot of stuff mm. that convinced, ultimately convinced us mm. that 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 there was a need to return. Well, I have two more questions, and I'm going to turn it over. So I think one of the things that I've really, um, you know, I've learned from you a lot about that there are complexities to. There's a lot of complexity around leadership as a discipline. And yet, when you break it down, it can be very simple and poignant. What does corruption look like when you're 19? It looks like cheating. You know, let's right. talk about it like that. Right. You know, um, and so I think this this idea of um, of you know really simple examples that that others follow um, is something that you you know you speak about and do a lot. And so if I could ask just to tell one more story, which really profoundly affected me. Um, about the your team members that were complaining about the trash. Do you remember this right, story? Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, I was in my office, and a faculty member knocked on my door, walked in my office, and he said, "Look, I'm teaching a programming class in the computer lab, and there's litter everywhere." And I, you know, I, I didn't know what to make of it. I said, "Really." Um, so I get up and I follow him to the computer lab, mm -hmm. and I walk in the door, and there was litter, there was paper all over the floor, but the floor was clean, right, so there was no dirt on the floor, so I said, okay, so the cleaning staff did their job this morning, mm -hmm. right, but it's just, they're printing stuff and they're just tossing it on the floor, and I didn't know what to do, so I just started picking up the paper. I just, I just like, oh, and then I just started picking up paper. And then students were typing, and then suddenly everyone froze. 
they looked at me, and then boom, there was no paper on the floor. It was like, everybody stopped what they were doing, picked up all the litter, and put in the trash. Um, and then they came to me uh, after that class and apologized, and they said, we feel so ashamed. And I asked them, so were you okay sitting in a room with litter all over the place? Clearly somebody had come and cleaned up the room, and what's, what was going on? And they just, they just said, look, this will not happen again. And um, today, if you come to our campus, it's very clean. It's immaculate. It's just like, there's no litter. And so we had that incident, and then we went through a few years where every, every September, when the freshman class shows up, <laughs> see litter on campus, and then it stops. And then the next year, freshman class shows up, it's litter on campus, and then it stops. Now the freshmen show up this moment. It's just like, it's just part of the fabric of the place. Um, people just have this sense of responsibility yeah. that you need to sort of care about the environment. And, um, you know. Leadership master class from Patrick. <laughs> Sometimes you just pick up the trash. Right, exactly. <laughs> Sometimes, Sometimes you just pick up the trash. Yeah. 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 You know, and if I stopped there and I made a speech, it probably wouldn't have been as effective. Yeah. Yeah. Leading by example. Leading by example. That's it. Okay, fin my final question. So we talk about um, the pressures of being excellent at what you want to do, and then also being lifelong learners, right. and, um, and and also just you know this concept of being limitless. That you can be exposed to other things, um, and that you know sort of the richness of your life will be about exploring all these other things. So you, you've practiced judo. Uh, your, karate. Shoto, karate. Shoto, shoto, shoto. Okay. Your really entire adult life. Yes, since college, yes. So, so it's sometimes in these leadership conversations, Patrick will make like a, a, a very profound analogy to, you know, use the weight of your body, your or use the weight of your opponent and these sorts of things. Um, what is this, you know, tell us about that. What has it taught you? How does it help you balance the pressures of, you know, building a chassis. So my first interest in the martial arts was I just wanted to learn self-defense. Right? Because you know when I was in high school I was I was small relative to my colleagues and I got bullied and so on. And I just wanted to learn how to punch people, you know. <laughs> and, and, and and my dad ref refused to let me do that crap. So when I went to college and I started and um, because there's no one to tell me not to do it. Um, but I really fell in love with the art, the art of it. I fell in love with the, the discipline mm. and the, the beauty of the movement, the economy of movement, mm. the precision. You're always trying to be more precise. Um, and there was also a very deep sense of respect, respecting others, mm. respecting yourself, respecting your opponent, and all of that. So actually, the martial arts is really not about violence, right? It's not about going off and punching people. <laughs> um, so, and I kept at it, and it's really good physical exercise. So, but there's there are lots of things that you learn uh, from the martial arts about about pushing yourself, about uh, pushing others, encouraging others, um, learning to breathe. <laughs> um, and things like, you know, if you're, if you have a much bigger opponent, you know, how you use the weight against them, mm -hmm. instead of going, how you use the ground, you, you use stuff around you to help you accomplish your aims. Um, so it kind of, it kind of bleeds a bit into, um, you know, how I function in life. Mm -hmm. um, every year you, you find out that you, there's so much you don't know. Like when in the martial arts, you know, I remember I had this really big goal of becoming a black belt, and you know, my uh, the, my first test of black belt I failed, and I was shocked, and actually the whole dojo was shocked because I performed so well in the test, but I failed because there was this guy who was a third dan, a very senior black belt that I sparred with, and I was determined that he would not win, and so I was very aggressive. And we would always sort of 
punch at the same time and we would pull short, but it was a draw, that match was a draw. Mm. But I showed so little respect to this guy who was my senior. And the and Sheehan who was doing the test failed me because I didn't show respect to my senior. Um, even though physically I, I done everything right. And I was really I quit karate for a year after that. I, I stopped karate. I said, okay. Forget this, I'm gonna go ship Windows MT. Right? <laughs> and I just sort of prayed myself at Microsoft. And I came back a year later and um, Sensei was like, welcome back. <laughs> you know, and I, I resumed and I a year later I tested again. I passed and I got to second down. But I remember getting my first degree black belt and then suddenly realizing how little I knew so all the stuff that I needed to learn. To get to my second round. And um, I've been I've had a second down for 18 years. Mm -hmm. I haven't tested for 18 years. Um, you know, I started a chassis mm -hmm. and I'm teaching um, uh, someone in karate. I totally focused on that. Um, and this year I'm gonna test my third time. Mm -hmm. So this year I resume back to finding. I got my student to brown belt. Wow. <laughs> Exciting! <laughs> so, awesome! So, um, and, and this is someone who was like my weakest student in class and she stuck with it and it's been a, it required a lot of patience and sort of meeting her where she, mm. she was and sort of working with her, mm. accepting her limitations and getting her. Now she'll be a black belt in a couple of years. Wow. So I feel like I can also not so this year, between March and June, is my goal. This March and June. This March and June. Three to six months. We are, we're your new support network. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, yeah, so karate is important to me, and it keeps me centered. I'm just the exercise of it, just a meditation to focus on it, which is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. um, hi. Um, so, um, my first time find, finding out finding out about HSC was like around two years ago. Uh -huh. Um, one of my friends joined us HSC, and like he couldn't stop talking about how awesome that place was. <laughs> and um, I like, you guys. And like he kept talking about how. Um, you can leave anything anywhere at SSC and no one will take it. And I was like, like in a campus, like no one would steal your laptop, like you just leave it around and everything. So I was like, um, how do you make people who come from um, countries in Africa in general a way for us? And um, in, when we have, um, especially in like our campuses, like here in Kenya, for example, we have like, a lot of stealing involved, a lot of cheating and all these things, right? So how do you help people unlearn these things that they've known right. since they were young? And then at the same time also, um, HSC has grown now and you've scaled. Um, how does culture scale also right. so that it's, it doesn't erode as they grow right. also? Yeah. So that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that the really hard thing was actually establishing the culture in the first place. Right? That was a very heavy lift because students are coming from a background where this was rampant. Cheating, stealing was the norm. Um, in some cases, they considered it an act of altruism to help somebody pass an exam, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so that was difficult. Now, moving forward from there, um, I realized very quickly that it couldn't be about me trying to maintain the culture. It had to be the whole organization trying to maintain the culture. So now when, when new students join, they're entering a culture that is very strong. And it's strong because the people already there each feel a sense of responsibility towards the culture, right? If they didn't, and if it was up to me, then it wouldn't scale. It scales if everyone is on board and every, everyone is trying to maintain that. 
The second thing is, you know, it's really interesting. You know, this friend of yours is telling you about the fact that they can leave their laptop in noise music, or they they're trusted to have exams without any delays. There's an incredible sense of pride that students have. So, in a way, once a culture is established, it has become something that people value it for its own sake. They value the fact that they can be in a community where they can trust each other, that they can be trusted. And they are very anxious to maintain that, right? Be kind of a disgrace if that culture sort of failed while your friend was a student of the Shasi. Mm -hmm. This is a culture that was built before they arrived, and now they're here and it fails on your watch, mm -hmm. right? And now you don't trust people around you and you're not trusted. Um, so they kind of see the value of a high trust environment. Um, and that's that's a very powerful force that motivation. All right, a uh, follow up question. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, a lot of the times I feel like, um, okay, I'll speak about it and we say things won't change. Like, we're always saying things won't change. That's just how it's always been. Like, right. So, um, I'm sure Ghana might have also had the same yeah, problem. Yeah. So, um, when you're building a chassis, what gave you the confidence to believe that things could actually change? I didn't know for sure that things would change. But I felt that it was necessary for things to change. And it was necessary for someone or some sort of small group of people to work towards making that change. And that's all you have. You say, okay, this is a necessary project. And I need to be part of trying to make that change. And then you just go for it. And you do the best you can. I mean, that's my, because I, you know, and when I encounter real big difficulties, I always remind myself, this is precisely why a chassis exists, so that these difficulties will go away in the future. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to let these difficulties sort of make me give up, right? By the way, the government of Ghana now comes to Patrick and Ashesi quite frequently yeah. for oh. advice on all things budgeting. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that true? Yeah. They're like, how do we learn to budget the way that Ashesi does? True story. Energy consumption on yeah. in Ghana. Sanitation. Yeah. Wow. Hey, uh, it's, it's been like really, really awesome just sitting here in the studio. Um, managing a compass with that level of integrity is just super well. Really big thank you for that. Um, I'm just I'm just having two major follow-up questions. All right. Um, building such type of a culture in, in an African country is such a heavy thing. I was I was actually on Twitter yesterday and there was this photo of Dubai and some Nigerian guy tweeted visiting Nigeria in 20, 2035 and like Removing away from Nigeria so is like all these incredible tweets and comments. And like that. Mm. But how do you wake up each and every day um, determined to create an, an impact in each and every person in it? What sort of what was, what what sort of impact would it be, and how would you reach out to the less growing generations, like students in campus? giving them the motivation that if we do this this way, we are having a promising future for ourselves. Like how is how is that generational level uh, being raised from the beginning? So right now one of my biggest motivators is just seeing how well our students and alumni are doing. Right. Mm -hmm. So taking the time to recognize that certain things are going really well. Um, it's a very energizing thing for me. But, you know, I will admit to you that I don't wake up every morning completely charged up. <laughs> you know, there, there are moments of doubt, there are moments of 
you know, feeling tired. Um, it's just part of it's just part of the territory. And um, when those moments happen, you just have to remind yourself of all the things that are going right. And to remind yourself that all of those things went right in spite of all these difficulties um, and so on. And, and you just need to keep pushing. Yeah, so my last question is, um, is this generally how the structure of the organization and the company is? So how often as a leader do you get to talk to the junior, junior level staff? And what what is all that conversation about? For example, like a clean in the campus or um, maybe just a junior teaching staff, I mean, tutoring staff, something like that. How is how how often do you do it, and what is the conversation about? So let me first say that I think that it's really important to talk to everybody, right? And, and I do that, and it comes from a, an experience I had when I was 18 years old. Um, there's this beggar in the street that I used to give money to all the time, and one day I spoke with him, and he just started to cry, and I started to cry as well. And what I what I learned from that was that just seeing him and speaking with him just as another person was more important to him than the money I was giving him. So from that day, I decided I speak to everybody, right? Now, I don't get to have deep, long conversations with everybody, but I can certainly say good morning or good afternoon. When I bump into someone, when I pass someone in the hallways, I just, I just greet them, right? Um, I have an open door policy, so anybody can come to my office and talk with me. Uh, there's staff members that want to meet with me. Sometimes we meet in my office. Sometimes we meet on a walk on campus. Um, I go eat in the cafeteria. Um, I stand in line along with everybody to queue for my lunch. And when I'm in line, I get to talk with people, students or staff, or whoever is in line. Um, I sit down with people. And when you sit down over lunch, that's when you can really have a, a longer conversation with people. Right? And we talk about whatever is on people's mind. It's, it's interesting to the junior staff, when I'm meeting with them and talking with them, they want to talk about local politics. <laughs> You know, and we talk about local politics. Um, actually, that comes up a lot. Yeah. <laughs> We're just talking about what's going on with politics in Ghana. Yeah. And we talk about the economy and stuff like that, right? Um, so it's just, it's just having a human conversation with people. Right? How often do they ask if you want to run for office? They stop asking. <laughs> <laughs> they used to ask, it, and I, yeah. I would say, "No, I'm not interested in politics." And so that's that stopped. Yeah. Can I yes. Um, or two part question, I guess. Okay. Um, so if you mentioned you, know, you started a university, right. that's a place where you can start a culture from scratch. Right. right. Um, what kinds of skills or tools um, do you give the students so that once they leave and they re-enter a culture that you know has been pre existing right. for some time, how do they how do you prepare them to survive and even thrive in right. yeah in that environment that is a different culture from what you just did? So that's a good question. We we have a we have a course, actually it's a part of a course that we call Giving Voice to Values. And it's based on some research that was done in the US. Um, it essentially says that you know, everyone has a set of values, and most people know what's right and wrong. Um, the difficulty is people don't always get to practice um, voicing their values. And so when they actually encounter a, 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 an ethical dilemma, they actually act, it's actually a dilemma for them, right? Um, and so the way to actually address that is to do simulations, right? So. We have this course that has simulations of ethical dilemmas. And students read up these types of simulations and then they enact them. So there's 
you know, there's somebody in the situation, there's somebody who's pushing for something wrong to be done, etc. And they role play how do you deal with this scenario. Some of the cases in that course are cases written up by our alumni who have actually experienced those cases in the real world and have navigated, right? And the, the challenge is to say, how do you navigate this ethical dilemma? Accomplish what you've set out to accomplish without making unnecessary enemies and without compromising your own ethical compass, right? And getting things done. So how do you do all these three things? Um, and uh, so it's just a matter of let, having students practice so with, the, with the hope that when they actually encounter it in real life, so, oh, I saw this scenario before, and this is how the person dealt with it, this is how I dealt with it. Um, some of the toughest cases, um, you know, you find that you cannot, in fact, um, get the job done, not make enemies, and keep your ethical compass yeah. pointing north. And in those cases where you can't find that solution, people quit, and the alumni will come and say, look, I encountered this situation, I just could not get around it. And I left this place and went somewhere else. That is not an optimal solution. You, you should always try to find a solution that meets these three criteria before you just get up and leave. And it's certainly not optimal to just cave in and do what it is that's being asked. Right? So that's how we're dealing with it. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting to actually ask the mediations so yeah. people can actually practice. And uh, sorry, my follow-up question or second follow-up question is that, uh, um, so I studied political and social thought for my undergrad. I'm not a developer, okay. so okay. that's nice. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but so I did um, take courses on ethics and, and things like that. And, you know, the context of them, they always, you know, we're doing readings by old Greek people uh, yeah. a long time ago, a different right. place, a different right. time. Um, and I guess the underlying assumption is that this is universal, right? But in actual practice, you know, how do you make, how do you take these ideas about ethics and then contextualize them for ethics in Africa, leadership in Africa, right. especially considering that we're such young nations that have gone through, like, I guess, right. going through massive transitions. Right. So, um, so we do the same. Uh, we actually, when we're looking at material for these sort of philosophical conversations, um, we're looking at Western philosophy, African philosophy, and, and Eastern philosophy, right? So we think that there's value in exploring um, different systems of philosophical thought, right? And in fact, uh, some of the philosophies are in fact universal. Like you will read Eastern philosophy that completely dovetails with African philosophy and the Greek philosophers. Right? Uh, and so, and it's actually, if we didn't have students read these three different systems and we just focus on the, the Greek ones, the world, you're telling us something from a different culture that doesn't apply to us. But by also including proverbs from Africa and, and writings on African philosophy, they get to see that actually there, there's a lot of similarity in how um, philosophers and leaders in the past have thought about what constitutes a good society and how to organize that good society. Um, there's some differences, and um, it's also the case that all these different these different regions have also had monarchies and absolute dictatorships and horrific wars and brutality and all of that. Um, and so it's good for students to sort of see all of this um, as they're sort of making up their minds about what kind of society do they want to see. Thank you for your question. Uh, it's actually also not very well accomplished. So my question is, do you think that the same can be replicated on existing campuses of justice scientists? 
and how do you think that can be achieved? We, we do think that it can be replicated in other, in, on other campuses. And somebody once asked me, actually just recently last year asked me, what are the things about the chassis that are most easily replicated? And it was, it was a tough question. I had to think about it for a bit. But my, my answer ultimately was the things that don't require a lot of money to execute are inherently replicable by everyone, including institutions that are resource strapped. Now, you could go to any university and say, okay, can you replicate the level of technological labs that MIT has? And the answer is no, we can't do it. I mean, they have so much more money than we do. They have such advanced equipment, et cetera, et cetera. But can we be as ethical or more ethical than folks at MIT or Harvard? Yeah, That's, that, that draws on our own internal resources, Africans, and our own willpower. And so those are the things that we actually have the capability to do. It's just that we have to make the decision to do them. And we have to make that decision um, corporately as a, as, a, as a group, not as just individuals. So it is possible to replicate, you know, a high integrity uh, campus across our campuses. This can be done. It's just that we have to decide that we're going to do it. Follow up question. Now that you brought up the issue of things that require one money right. uh, are hard to replicate, so it could be kind of a way to bridge that gap between the amount of resources that are available in the, in the campuses and that the ones that they need to actually achieve that. Right, so um, money is an interesting thing, right? <laughs> resources are interesting. There's a lot of resources in the world and those resources are not static. They flow. They move from point A to point B all the time. There's, they're in constant motion. Uh, now, there's a certain kind of resource that flows towards excellence. And so, as organizations achieve excellence, they're more likely to attract certain kinds of funding. Uh, as they achieve excellence, the alumni are going to be uh, more successful, they're going to have more resources to give back to their own institution, they're going to feel a love for the institution and want to give back to pass forward whatever good things they experienced. Um, external actors are more likely to want to support something that is excellent and something that is not, right? So it's there's a stepwise process. You can't jump from here to there in one move. But from wherever you are, if you're constantly improving, you can attract more resources to keep that trajectory up. That's that's my personal belief, and that's certainly what's happened with us at the Chessy, that as we have proved ourselves, as we've maintained excellence, there are certain uh, organizations and individuals who have felt more comfortable giving money uh, to help us get to the next level. Thank you. So, I'm, I'm probably the most excited person here today. <laughs> <laughs> Reason being, I've been following uh, Chessy's story and myself for a while now. And I remember watching your uh, TED Global Talk in 2007 in Tanzania. And I remember how passionate you are about being a part of African Innocence. Right. And how you felt strongly that you wished there was a liberal arts college in every country now, right? Yes. And back then in 2007, uh, Chessy was only five years old and you had only entered the two classes. Right. And now it's almost 16 years. Yes. I'm wondering if you still feel that you can achieve your mission. But if not, how close are you to achieving that? <laughs> so, um, so we've not achieved our mission yet, right? Mission is uh, the mission is a journey. It's contributing towards an African Renaissance, and it's going to be something that will do for the remainder of a chassis existence, which I think is, I hope is going to be forever, right? Like our name means beginning. 
Every year is going to be a new beginning of that mission. Um, so the question of um, a liberal arts college in every country, I should say that what I should have said is we need universities in every country that are teaching critical thinking, uh, broad perspectives, innovation, ethics. Right? Um, that, that is very much still a work in progress. Uh, we have started uh, a project a couple of years ago to share what we're doing with other universities. I think something like um, uh, maybe 25 institutions have participated in what we call education collaborative, where we're actively sharing with others uh, in the hopes that we can be in a more proactive position helping them to have a transformation on their campuses. Um, you know, we would like to see a replication of our model across the continent. And it's going to happen in one of two ways, maybe both, maybe just one. Replicating the idea to existing institutions or institutions that are newly established by other people. And the other is replicating a chassis itself, setting multiple campuses on the chassis. We have not yet taken the step of trying to replicate our campus elsewhere. Um, but it's still a possibility. And um, you know, the way we operate is we sort of do these 10 year plans of what we can do in the next 10 years. This year, we're starting a planning process for our third decade. And so the question is gonna arise again, should we be aiming to set up satellite campuses elsewhere on the continent? I don't know the answer to that question, but it's an answer that we're gonna come, we're gonna achieve collectively. It's not even going to be my executive team making that decision. This third decade, we're involving all the faculty and mm -hmm. the staff. It's going to be an institution-wide process of generating ideas from the entire team, um, gener generating ideas from outside our organization, generating ideas from the board, and trying to find um, a couple of ideas that meet uh, at least three requirements. Well, obviously, it has to meet our mission, right? Uh, but beyond serving our mission, is it a bold enough, big enough idea? Is it an idea that is organizationally feasible for us? That, in other words, we either already have the capability or think we can have the, we can build the organizational capability to execute. And is it financially feasible? And so we're going to find something that fits those three things, that's bold and sort of um, really move the needle, but, but that we know or that we believe we can execute organizationally and we can have its financial level. And financial feasibility means that we can raise the money to execute it and that it will be self-sustaining or sustainable in some way once it's been executed. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned that you woke up one day and uh, decided to come back on the continent. Come back on the continent with an idea, a vision, a vision. You created the chassis and you made it up to now. Uh, that is really, uh, it's, not, it's not common on the continent. So many people might uh, come back, try to create something, but hey, where do you think? They are failing. Is it uh, mm. on the leadership side? Is it on the capacity side? Uh, I mean, in the main, or is it on the money ones? Well, failure occurs for many different reasons. Um, not only for projects in Africa, for projects people will return to Africa. You go to any country, there's lots of people starting things that fail. Um, and some of those people will get up and try again, and try again, and try again. Maybe, you know, on the third try, they'll be successful. Right? Uh, now, so, and there are many different reasons why organizations fail. Um, organizational feasibility, financial feasibility, <laughs> obviously. Is it a good idea? Um, sometimes you can come up with an idea that does not necessarily meet the needs of the market. 
or to meet the needs of society. Uh, and those kinds of ideas will fail because, or it fails because there's somebody else doing the same thing better than you are in a way that better meets the needs of society. Um, sometimes failure occurs just because of bad timing. You know, it's a perfectly good idea, but um, you were too early or you were too late. Somebody else got ahead and got such a head start that you couldn't catch up. Or you started too early and you weren't able to get people's minds around it. You fail and then somebody else comes and picks it up very nicely, conveniently, because you're established and the market is now ready, right? Uh, and then sometimes things fail because the leadership fails, right? And leadership failures occur for many different reasons. Um, not being grounded in the right values, uh, being stretched too thin, uh, being too arrogant or dictatorial, um, not really listening to advice. You know, there's all kinds of reasons why not being able to sort of um, motivate people to get something done. Those are all reasons why a project might fail. And then sometimes we just a really good idea but in an environment that is extremely toxic. So I could not succeed with the chassis in a country where there's a hot war going on, where there are bombs going off, people being killed. I would not be able to raise the money for such a venture. Um, the economy wouldn't be ready for it. Even though a university that teaches ethics is a really good idea, in a certain environment, it's just too hostile for it to really take root. Okay, one, one, one last one. <laughs> yeah, so you are talking about student um, courses, excuse me, if you call it a bug, but a new one is in campus, which is yet Actually, most of my students are not sure of that also. So, what is your uh, like a to let you go and play your virtual something? Because I think most of this are uh, the students can get it with the athletes from the eight to learn the values they are values from. So, do you have a way of knowing that this can make me now to 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 your teachers? Well, I mean, when we're uh, screening for people to come to join us, we look for cultural fit with our organization. Right. And for example, on for the lectures, um, we want people who are not going to be, their whole attitude is not about crushing the spirit of their students or trying to show that I am so much better than my students, that sort of thing. Right. Um, so we, we, we try to screen for those kinds of things. We have them do things that, you know, we'll ask them to write a statement of a teaching philosophy. Some people, will look at that assignment and say, I'm too big for, for this assignment, right? And they will self-select out. Some people look, for that look at that assignment and they will go plagiarize <laughs> somebody's statement. And then it's easy to say no. Um, some people will give a lot of thought and write something compelling and come and sort of explain to us why they have that philosophy. Um, so we try to do that screen, but in the end, you also have to have a cultural uh, setting on your campus because you will occasionally get the wrong person in on your team. It's just inevitable. You can't, no, no process is perfect and you're going to make some errors and you have to have um, a system that can identify when you've made an error and correct it. Does that resonate? Yeah. Have y'all seen things not be accepted into the Andela culture <laughs> and sort of be rejected real quickly? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, that definitely resonates for me. Okay, one final. So, um, thanks for creating time for this. 
there's a case study here in Kenya of a school I was in, and as soon as the founder passed away, I think it's just uh, within the community, mostly we say, probably that's why things are not going as well as they used to. And uh, so my question, my first question is, uh, uh, in terms of succession, is that uh, something you're working at and how are you working at it? Um, I guess it's something that can really help <laughs> you. But I'm, uh, I'm just saying it's, it's a great question. <laughs> then, so, so uh, one final one is, uh, or the second part is, uh, uh, what can kill uh, culture, like in the context of uh, session? Uh, you mentioned that there is, I can view it as a gate of keeping people who are not culturally fit as maybe one of the steps you are evading or ensuring that the culture still goes on. But uh, what are the things that you do? Or are you aware of some things that can actually kill the culture? And uh, yeah, maybe you think something about it. Or so, what can kill the culture? All right, so succession planning is something that uh, we started to intentionally think about um, in 2012, right? So, um, so that was what six, uh, seven years ago we we said we need to build a succession plan. Um, but in truth, we had already started uh, doing um, some critical things around succession. So I think that the the first and most important thing is what the governance structure of the organization is, right? So I report to a board of directors um, at the university, and I also report to a board of trustees at our international foundation in the United States. Um, that board, the, the, the university board of directors, has the power to fire me. I'm the founder, but I have a five-year contract with the Chessy. It's a five-year renewable contract. And if I am not forming or if I go crazy or whatever, I become a tyrant or something, that board can and will remove me and find another president. Um, and and so that having a, a governance structure that is not beholden to the CEO is really important. Um, I don't serve on any board committees. I report to the board committees. Now, we made this transition, I think in 2007, 2008 or about. First, I was even the chairman of the board. And then I stepped down as chairman and got somebody else as chairman of the board. And I removed myself from the committees of the board. Then I did contracts with the board. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is to have a process in place for how the organization goes about recruiting and hiring a future president. And then how to have a process in place for how the president goes about recruiting and hiring senior executives. So we have that in place. We have an emergency succession plan in place. And that's if you know I get struck by lightning, I get hit by a bus, something un totally unexpected, not a planned absence. Um, what does the organization do? How does it respond? Um, and how do we fill the gap on a temporary basis while they search for the next permanent mm -hmm. resident? Um, and then finally, uh, our succession plan involves a strategy to recruit um, and develop great talent within the organization. And that talent pool has to grow to a level where <coughs> we will have internal candidates for any um, executive level positions, including the presidency at some point in the future. So that when the board is making a search, doing a search for the next president, they'll be able to recruit both externally and internally. Uh, so this is now the internal development of people, that's a work in progress. 
and that's going to take time. But we're very intentionally building up the administrative team, building up the, the faculty, uh, so that the board will have choices. So, okay. All right. Um, well, thank, thank you all so much. much. We've got a little bit of time if you want to just mingle around afterwards. But I forgot I forgot one critical thing, Patrick. So the official name of this is Endela Kenya, but I figure you all should tell him the unofficial name or the nickname that you chose for this place. <laughs> the dojo. In your honor, didn't even know it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank wow. you so much. This is well, amazing. thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for giving the time today and for super thoughtful questions. It's been fantastic. Yeah. Thank you for everybody that joined remotely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm going to have to